Hello? So groggy. Hello. Is the uh, audio good? Uh, yeah, you sound fine. All right, hit me up. Give it to me. All right, so uh, quick thing. I recently started getting into more of your content and like Destiny's content pre or post COVID because, mm -hmm. you know, I had no life. So that was the only thing I could do. Um, and before that, I was like a Steven Crowder, Ben Shapiro kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, my whole family's conservative, all that stuff. And you guys have pushed me more towards the middle, but still not all the way. Um, and the big thing is just more so, I feel like there needs to be a, a, a middle ground. So in order to have a middle ground, you need far on both sides. And I think you do the far on the left. Conservatives are a little bit more on the right, and it'll go more towards the center and get more of like a sock dem feel. Well, if you uh, moved over to being a sock dem from being a Steven Crowder fan, that's um, an enviable movement. I can't complain about it. Uh, did you have anything in particular you wanted to disagree about? Yeah, the... Uh... Big thing is, well, first tell me what your stance is on, um, like promoting personal choice over, um, talking about the, uh, how we're all creatures of our environment and that sort of stuff. I mean, it depends on what your job is, right? If you're an environmental psychologist or if you're a politician or, or, or therapist, I mean, it depends on like from where you're standing, right? Like, it, from, from my position, like, it is a fact of the matter that people respond predictably to given environmental stimuli, and that if you want to change how people behave, you have to change their environment. But, like, if I was talking to my friend, like, if I had, like, a black friend or whatever, I wouldn't just say, ah, uh, yeah, your outcomes are because of your zip code, you were born here and you're black. I would, like, encourage them to do whatever they can to maximize their own well-being, you know. Um, in spite of whatever advantages or disadvantages they may have. I think there's a big difference between how you would talk about this to, like, a person you know, as opposed to, like, making broad social prescriptions. Do you think the... what you do can have a bad impact on individuals because you stream two individuals? I mean, everyone does everything two individuals, technically, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what we are if you break it all down. Um, but exactly. no, I don't think and, so. And that's... That's kind of my point. Like, I, so more background with me is uh, I'm a personal trainer or was now I'm a manager. And mm -hmm. when we get people who are not in shape, they need to lose weight. They have a lot of other bad health habits and just life habits that are wrong with them. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about like a lot of them come in thinking like, well, this is just how it is. It is what it is. And they have that mindset already. And I feel like the more that you talk about that rather than saying it's the personal choice, we all should do that, it, it pushes a, a wrong message. Well, I, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, both of these things are true. There's a reason why the rates of obesity and being overweight have skyrocketed in America over the past 50 years. It's not because everyone suddenly stopped being personally responsible. It's because of changes to the way our society operates, namely the kinds of food that we eat. And the kinds of food we eat are largely dictated by environmental conditions. So, I mean, both of these things can be true. If you want an individual to lose weight, you have to talk about maintaining a calorie deficit and working out. But if you want to talk socially why people are gaining weight, you can't just say like, oh, everyone just started getting lazy, because that's not true. Americans work more hours than ever. What you have to talk about is a, a bunch of, you know, complicated social factors, right? And it's the same way for poverty, and it's the same way for a bunch of other things. And I don't think it's bad to inform people on the sociological, un like, uh, conditions that lead to a given state of affairs. I, I think that's where our big disagreement is because I, I think the more that you say that, the more people lose their the motivation, the drive. Because I, I believe you've talked about this before about how people are predictable and they'll do what they, what society says. And the more that you say this is the norm, people are okay with being the norm. And I, I understand that policies can be passed. So if we're talking about obesity, right, you can pass something to have higher taxes on sugar or some bullshit. I don't know. I, I don't know any of this shit, but mm -hmm. you could do something like that, right? Or if you don't, if you you don't could... talk about the big social like implications, though, you lose the ability to make any systemic changes. Like everything regarding our tax policy, everything regarding welfare and education, 
everything regarding healthcare spending, all of our like big social decisions have to be based on an understanding that people are susceptible to their environmental conditions. What you're advocating here for here is ignorance. You're advocating for an ignorance of sociology because you think that it would encourage people to be more individually responsible. But I've never seen any like information or data or anything to indicate that there is a positive correlation between ignorance and personal accountability. Uh, I, I I also haven't seen much where there's been a widespread spread problem and the uh, awareness of the social problem has made it so that big policies get passed as far as like what about social security poverty, or, or medicare or medicaid or any of our welfare policies or public education or i mean i again i don't know much about that but i feel like it didn't have it may have had an impact on a certain people but it didn't solve the problem what do you, what do you mean like we so there were two approaches here like you have public education and you can say like oh public education is just an entitlement oh by saying the reason why people aren't getting good enough education is because we don't have any schools in america you're just giving excuses to people's individual lack of motivation or you could just build public schools and like we know the positive outcome here is just to make positive changes to people's environment right I, I, I'm just saying, I don't think the, I think when you go about it, I, maybe this is just where I, I lose touch with the lefty community, right? I, I feel like going about it by promoting policy is, is something that you can't really impact. But this I mean, at least I haven't seen it. Like my whole life, everyone has been saying how like, uh, Obesity is a problem. Uh, poverty is a problem. Um, uh, the relationship with cops is a problem, and everyone's been promoting policies to change it. But I haven't seen any that has really impacted it, and it makes me lose faith in a government being able to we, do that. Well, we do. I mean, the amount of people who have medical insurance went up massively with Medicare and Medicaid. Social Security dramatically reduced the mortality rate of like elderly people and the rate of like elderly poverty. Public education's massive, uh, massively increased the like general education of the country. Like all of these things have measurable impacts. The reason why America has far more poverty and far less social mobility than Norway isn't because people in Norway are like more intelligent or more spirited, it's because their institutions are better. And if you really wanted to prevent something, say, like obesity, you have to realize encouraging everyone to work super duper extra hard is way, way harder and way less effective than just changing the laws governing the types of food companies produce. That's the reason why everyone got fat. It's like, we didn't all get lazy. Like, they just started making food that, that just tended not to be that good for us. And it's also really cheap and a lot of people don't have the time or the money to get, you know, to do proper home cooking. Like these systemic solutions can make unbelievable changes, but this mantra of conservative individual responsibility has never done any good, like ever, anywhere. There's no social problem that's ever been fixed by somebody loftily saying, oh, well, they just need to work harder. It's like, it's never done anything, you know? It, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I agree and disagree because I agree that you are a product of your environment to an extent, but I just don't. Maybe I'm just, I'm, I'm only 25. Maybe I just haven't seen enough, you know, change from all the uh, lefty people at work that I just haven't seen in my lifetime. So maybe it's just something I need to get a little older and see, but. Um, I mean, a lot of the policies in America right now don't do shit because our government is completely blocked up. I mean, our government has been essentially like non-functioning since like two years into the Obama presidency. Barely anything's been able to get through because of the Republican like Congress. So we don't actually have much of a metric by which we can determine what legislation leads to what big systemic impacts. But back when our government used to function, you can take a look at these huge shifts in like performance or in, in, in behavior based on like the outcomes of policy. A lot of people think policy is like this top-down authoritarian thing, but like I pay taxes to the government. If those taxes go back to the people, I don't think there's anything authoritarian about that. 
Um, I, I, I mean, I think if anything, that's proper restitution. And when applied properly, you know, you get these really, really, really good outcomes. If you want to take a look at like homelessness numbers, for example, between us and the social democracies in Europe, I just, just like, you can tell homeless people to like get up off their feet and pull their bootstraps all you want. But there's a reason why America has so many homeless people, you know, and there's a reason why some other countries don't. And it's not because of personal responsibility. So we have to, I, I my personal opinion, I'm sorry if I'm rambling. My personal opinion is we should defer to those whose job is policy, policy, and defer to those whose job is responsibility, responsibility. When we're talking to individuals, advocate responsibility. And then when we're talking about policy, we advocate for what we know is going to lead to the best outcomes on average. Okay. I, I get that. And then here's a question, because like I said, very new to this uh, political mm -hmm. stuff that you guys do. Why would you say that government has not been working for the past two years? Because if I was to guess from an outsider's perspective, I would say is the polarization of both sides not being able to work together. Is that would that be right? Yeah, well, it'd be the past 10 years because two since two years into the Obama presidency when he lost Congress um, since then, like we basically got nothing. It's mostly Mitch McConnell. Um, Democrats are usually willing to like vote at least they'll hold votes on like republican bills but uh mitch mcconnell doesn't even doesn't even put anything up for a vote so it's pretty much that the government basically is on lockdown because of mitch um which is pretty unfortunate i would say um maybe we can do something about that soon so why would republicans be okay with that if that was well wouldn't everyone want to have the government working the way it should, whether it's for their policies or not? Well, that's always been the Republican strategy. When they take control of government, they tend to run it very poorly, and then they say it's the fault of the government for running it poorly. So right now, Republicans have spent the past 10 years, literally the past decade, complaining about the, you know, the, the ineffectiveness of government and how Congress is a gridlock and how nothing can get done, and this is why big government's bad and you can't trust big government, but they're the ones doing it. Like, if you look back, they do this with other social welfare programs, too. They'll defund them, or they'll, like, subvert them in other ways. And then when they stop functioning, they can use that as an excuse to condemn them, usually following it up with privatization. That's their goal. They're doing that with the post office right now, which is practically run like a business as it is. Uh, Betsy DeVos has been doing this with um, public education, because she wants everybody to have to pay a, throw a quarter into a little uh, slot every time you enter or exit your elementary school building. Um, when you take uh, the EPA as well, which has been run poorly and defunded so that all of these factories don't have to handle as many environmental regulations. You have the, um, um, oh God, you're, you have the, um, uh, the IRS. The IRS has been massively defunded. They don't even have the resources necessary to handle tax fraud being done by wealthy people. Wealthy people have lawyers. Poor people don't. The IRS goes after poor people because they know it's easy pickings. Yeah, the CDC as well, which has been defunded massively. So like all these government programs, the Republicans don't want them to function properly. And they put corporate cronies at the head of these programs because doing so allows them the excuse to essentially privatize the functions being run by these government programs. I thought you said that things were running fine pre 10 years ago though well it was there better it was it, it was it, there was a pretense of functionality before 10 years ago now things are completely gridlocked but the standard that i just said to you which is called um regulatory capture i think that's been going on for a long time okay i so this is from again this is from a person who recently got into you and destiny and people like that the way that you guys make it sound is there's no good to Republicans whatsoever. Yes. It, then how is half of America that way? Well, what attracted you to them? Um, more of like a individuality of a, uh, more like that bootstrap mm -hmm. attitude. It's the narratives they tell. It's the stories they tell. Republicans tell good stories about being a patriot, about being a small business owner, about being, a, you know, a culture warrior or whatever. They tell a lot of stories, but usually this is a distraction. When I talk with conservative-leaning people, they generally don't like to talk about policy. And the reason for that is because, I mean, the government's job is policy. That's what it does. That's the function of the government. But they don't like to talk about that stuff because when you talk about it, it usually doesn't make the Republicans look too good. Instead, they talk about this... 
they try to distract you with this culture war narrative. If you, like, you can watch, like, you remember, by the way, with Ben Shapiro and Steven Crowder, you can watch their content. 98% of that stuff is not about the nuances of policy, flat out. Most yeah. of it is about this constant fear-mongering that the left is at any moment going to destroy something that's valuable to you, whether that be, like, gender norms, or whether that be, like, um, your ability to open a business, or, like, it goes on and on, and they keep people fearful, and fearful people continue to vote. There's also a lot of aesthetic signaling. For example, like, rural people tend to vote Republican. Um, because that sort of like country boy homestead vibe gels better with the aesthetic Republicans try to push. And you also, of course, have like uh, Rust Belt workers who are mad at what they perceive to be like neoliberalism because a lot of their jobs got outsourced, but it's really, really complicated. And then there are people in the South who will always vote Republican because Republicans tend to be pretty racist. And a lot of those people like literally were alive back when they were throwing rocks at the Little Rock Nine. So it's there's a lot of like it's like a, a like a confederacy, funnily enough, of a bunch of different irrelevant virtue signally beliefs. And it, they all kind of get behind the Republicans, you know. Do you think that some of it may just be that they don't trust a government with higher funds and they'd rather trust the community handling it? Sure, but I don't know what the Republicans have to do with community handling. The Republican Party increases the size of government and deficit spending every time it's in. The last time we had a budget surplus was under Clinton, of all people. So if, they, if they're looking for small government, they would be socialists, I think, not... Um, well, I guess not. That's not fair. A lot of Americans don't really understand. That's fine. Not not everyone can go online and learn about all the fucking wacky ideologies out there. I don't think the Republican but, Party does very much to affirm like small government values. And that's kind of why things have kind of shook me recently because the online political community is fucking strange to me because the amount of like in depth that you guys go into policies is just not what like normal american voters think or talk about or even like realize mm -hmm. so that's why I, I i don't know if it is the american people that are just like clueless and are being sheep or if it's you online people who are just uh being way too polarizing and and amplifying things when really it's not that crazy I think Bernie Sanders had the right approach to this. Bernie Sanders probably has a lot of pretty radical positions locked up in his head that require a lot of nuance to deliver. But when Bernie Sanders was speaking publicly, he was just talking about very simple, very agreeable beliefs that Americans should be able to uh, uh, pay for their lives with a minimum wage salary, that a full-time minimum wage job should be a living wage, that Americans should have affordable health care. He tried to hammer on these really relatable, like really simple points. And I think that's the winning strategy for the left. I can defend the positions I believe in, or at least I think I can. I mean, I think I make an okay argument. But the reality is that the average American cares about what they're told to care about and a couple of very obvious things like their base existence, making sure they're able to afford rent and food, that kind of stuff. And as long as we know every American cares about making it to the next day, a lot of socialist principles are going to ring true in their ears. Not all of them, but some of them. And I think that's like the the, the wedge to get them on, you know? You, hmm. So, correct me if I'm wrong, you said a socialism regime would have to be overthrown someday, correct? Like, to have it, we would have to overthrow what we have as a government, correct? I don't think there's any way to achieve a democratic economy without there being some kind of direct confrontation between the people of a country and the people who are currently in charge of that country's um, means of production. So I do think that it would eventually come to that. But my goal would be that you could peacefully convince a great many people that they should have economic democracy. And then it's those who currently control it who get angry or spiteful or greedy, and they attempt to initiate violence. At which point, it's not us engaging in a revolution, it's just us defending our collective country's resources and assets from a group of insurrectionary assholes. Um, and I think that's a fight that we could win, too. I mean, if we convince people well. I, yeah, that... I gotta be honest with you, Vash. That, that's, that's where you guys and the online left community just loses me, because it, it's just... Like you said, people want to go day by day mm -hmm. and get by the next day. But the things that you're, you're talking about takes 
a lot of advocacy and uh, a lot of power and work. And I don't think the average American would ever do that. So why focus your time on something like that? Oh, sure. Well, that's not most of what I talk about, though. I just think it's something that we should be considerate of. But this has happened in the past. What I'm describing to you is basically what happened during the Revolutionary War, right? I mean, uh, it's I mean, it's always complicated, but the basic gist of it was that I'm pretty sure that if all of the loyalist forces of um, of King George had like thrown their hands up in the air and pulled back, there probably wouldn't have been any bloodshed when America formed the new colony. But of course, you know, I also think that's very different times and with the amount of technology that we have these days that do, do you think that they, Americans should be able to vote for economic democracy if they if they want that? Yes. Well, if they want that, and if they use the government to legally push for that, and there's no process, or there's no problem at all with the legal process, um, and and then the, uh, a, a group of elites in our society want to like engage in a coup d'état, do we not have a right to defend ourselves against that? I mean, it'd be it'd be pretty. Yeah, but I don't think people care that much. Well, who care think... about defending themselves or? Well, no. So like. Do I want to be able to, you know, have enough money to be able to do what I want, live live in a socialism state? Yes. But I don't know if I'm going to throw my life away to do that, nor do I think that most Americans will even go out and vote to do that. Because before well, I listened to you They wouldn't be voting guys, to throw I away their life. Vote. They'd just be voting for, like, a preferable economic policy, right? They would just be voting to, like you know, engage in economic democracy. And then like, then they're like, oh shit, what? The, the, a coup? What's happening? Like, I, I'm not saying that we should like push for a coup. I'm saying that I, I feel like given enough time as we make our society more free, those who would seek to constrict our freedom will eventually, you know, come a knocking. And that's just something that I want to be ready for. But that's not something that I would like talk about while advocating for socialism, you know? Right. What, what I'm saying is even going towards more free, I don't think that you'll get people. I think the socialism and the democratic messaging doesn't ring enough ears that those changes will never happen. Well, we'll have to see, I suppose. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. It's actually been a really good discussion. Apparently some uh, a, a person wants to talk really quick and I have to end the stream soon. So um, do you mind if we hang it here? Yeah, sounds good. Be well. Thank you for talking with me. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. Bye -bye. You too. That guy was cool. That guy was super good faith. Okay, who's this? Maximilian Musk. Hey, Maximilian.